Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to give another minute or so to allow other folks to join before we start. Thank you. Hey, hello everyone, and welcome today to today's presentation on semantic search, enriching and integrating SharePoint sites with Top Braid Edge. And for those of you that might be new to Top Quadrant, um, we were founded in 2001. Our flagship product is Top Braid Enterprise Data Governance. And we currently have around 200 plus customers. 40% of those are among the Fortune 500 and 60% are publicly listed. Just to review what we'll be going over in today's webinar, we're gonna cover search, the ultimate reason for managing content, how can taxonomies help? We'll do a demo and show these concepts in practice, as well as discuss integration, APIs, and other capabilities. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Also, what we want to introduce today's speakers, we have Top Quadrant's co-founder, Irene Pulikoff, and Jesse Lambert, a senior semantic solution architect with Top Quadrant. Before we get started, let's review a few logistical items. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along by using your GoToWebinar controls. To post questions, please look on the right-hand side control panel and you'll see a drop-down box for questions. If you click on the box, you should be able to post your question at any time during the presentation. And again, we'll address as many of these as, we, as time allows at the conclusion of the slides. We will also be recording today's webinar and we'll, we'll send a link to that recorded version as well as to the slides. Um, with that, I think we can hand it over to Irene to get us started. Irene? Um, thank you, Christy. Um, so the topic of our today's webinar is how can search be improved across all the um, variety of uh, content that a typical enterprise manages? And this is um, kind of a very old um, adage that you know, people, people say, a very uh, known fact that 80% of all the content in an enterprise is unstructured. And I remember hearing that fact maybe more than 20 years ago, and we're still talking about it, about it and we're still talking about improving search. So it's not a new problem. This problem has been around and persisted for quite some time. And the reason for it is that in reality, search is not simple. Uh, it's not simple because there is um, lots of content, uh, different types of content, internal, external, there are different formats, uh, there are different types of documents. Um, all this content is located in uh, different content repositories. Um, today we are focusing on SharePoint uh, in our demonstration and our conversation, but this concept is beyond the, just the SharePoint. And even with SharePoint, uh, most of our customers um, have multiple SharePoint sites as well. So it, it is fairly distributed. There's constantly new requirements in terms of why people are looking for content and um, that's that happens because there are changes in policies there's new opportunities changes in process and so on and importantly there's many different there are many different stakeholders that 
interact with uh, with content and the challenge here is that the right and most relevant search results for one person are not necessarily the right and most relevant search results for another person even if they're using uh, the same keywords in um, in their search queries it, it all depends on their role on their context on their point of view uh, what they are doing uh, etc and it's it, we should acknowledge that of course over this 20 plus years that we've been talking about search uh, lots of changes happened search has improved tremendously but we also have um, a growth in uh, in content in general and we also have growth in users expectations so what what is the situation today in in the enterprise uh, we still have towers um, and silos of content different types of documents they could be uh, policies and regulatory documents they could be employee handbooks um, they could be marketing materials and there's just uh, lots of it myself yesterday i was um, searching through some folders that i've got to find the title of a car that was bought antique car that was bought about 20 years ago and was I was surrounded by all those documents and was thinking my goodness how can just a couple of people generate so much uh, so much stuff so many documents now you multiply it on the thousands of employees of enterprise performing different processes and you are ending up with uh, a sea and variety of different documents and they are allocated in different repositories. Again, today our focus is SharePoint, uh, but there's also just file directories, uh, Amazon S3, you know, clouds, there's um, Adobe AM, and there's Salesforce and other tools that all con contain different types of uh, different types of content. So, um, what are the best practices for dealing with it today? Uh, many organizations today are hiring uh, content librarians by some title or in some form, and these are experts that specialize in organizing content. And you know, for not just for storage, but also for, for consumption. They have to think about how this content will be used when people are looking for it. And um, in doing that, they are coming up with um, content organization schemes that are typically called taxonomies. And these are various hierarchies. And so they um, designing how the content could be organized and then they also uh, are concerned about um, the processes for how you um, tag the content uh, using using this content organization schemes um, since i use the term uh, tag so it's I, I better explain what I mean by tag and tagging because today it's also can be used in um, various um, in in very in various way um, uh, so specifically when we talk about tagging we mean the process of linking content items such as you know picture that you could see here you could imagine it being an image in some image repository uh, but more broadly speaking it could be any kind of a document and um, linking the content items with terms from um, some vocabularies in the past, people were um, fascinated by the idea of uh, folksonomies, which is kind of a very free-flowing set, set of terms. Um, you create your own tags by using um, your own term, and uh, someone else uh, does it in a different way. Um, and you actually can see results of it uh, here. So, for example, you see Italy and Italia. So. Um, and here they use just the strings 
So that's not necessarily a single term with different language representation. It's um, whatever someone uh, has um, someone has decided to associate with with that image. So that would be an example of kind of uncontrolled um, uh, idea of tax. Uh, today uh, we are talking about uh, controlled vocabularies. So where those terms have are pre-designed, and then they used to um, to tag content with. So process of connecting content with some terms in some organized controlled vocabulary. Um, so with that uh, being said, there may be a question of how such controlled vocabularies for tagging uh, are created. What are they? How they are created? So that's um, also something that content librarian or a subtype of a content librarian called taxonomist may be busy with. And the product of their work is um, something called the taxonomy. Sometimes it can be an ontology. We will not go on this webinar into the differences between taxonomies and ontologies. We actually have some uh, good uh, webinars and articles on, on that topic. But it is, um, it, is a, uh, it is a structure where terms are organized hierarchically and terms contain uh, reach alternative names and synonyms. So you don't need multiple terms for Italy and Italia. It could be a single term, a single concept with different names, be it in different languages or be it just um, synonyms in, in a single uh, language. And um, this uh, taxonomies get created in a variety of ways. Uh, in an organization, you may already have a source of uh, taxonomy. Maybe you have some spreadsheets where you design some sets of uh, control terms. There is also some, um, for certain industries, there are some standards available out there, um, especially with uh, the field of medicine. There's lots of controlled vocabularies that deal with uh, chemicals, uh, symptoms, different types of drugs, etc. All of this can be uh, leveraged and reused, extending for your specific enterprise uh, and, and organized uh, and extended in the way it's needed. Another approach to um, creating a taxonomy is to start Bottom, bottoms up as opposed to tops down and take a look at some of the documents that um, you need to organize and see if you could extract terms from those uh, documents and then um, and then enrich them. So if some of those terms represent synonyms of each other, then you combine them. If there is um, sub some terms should be a subset of another term, you organize them hierarchically along that way. So that presents a, a good um, good approach to starting a, a taxonomy if there is no pre-existing external source. And um, all of these uh, activities for organizing, enhancing, extending, etc. taxonomies um, are supported by tools today. And when you um, look at the products such as SharePoint, uh, uh, there is some support for managing taxonomies. However, it may not be not it may not be as rich in as in a specialized and dedicated taxonomy management tool. But um, any content repository today has some ability to build taxonomies. And of course, uh, products such as Tabright Edge provide very rich set of capabilities for uh, managing taxonomies. So um, between um, being able to create taxonomy and having the right people in place uh, for managing content, uh, we get a lot of benefits. 
from taxonomies as a tool that can improve search. Um, it can provide consistent language to use across all your content and across all your content repositories. Um, and by doing so, it could actually unify, it, uh, unify your content and could even unify structured and unstructured data because um, you could use those taxonomies not just with SharePoint where you have uh, unstructured documents, but you could also use this with databases where the data is uh, more structured and it provides unifying, uh, unifying layer this way. It can be used to drive user experience, whether it's just browsing in a navigational way or whether it's kind of a stepwise navigation. First, you answer a question, you get another question, etc. Um, it can drive recommendations for what additional content you may be interested in based on the search, uh, based on the search that you have done. And it could also be used to provide different uh, facets and different viewpoints for different users. In fact, you could think about users and their interest as another, uh, another taxonomy. So this slide says taxonomy is a powerful tool, but it, it can be thought of as taxonomies, plural, are powerful tool because in reality, you um, are likely to have multiple taxonomies addressing different aspects of the, of the content. But in the search experience, they will come together as, as one. Uh, with this um, kind of a powerful tool uh, for improving search and improving search applications and improving content management in general, there are still uh, some challenges still re remain. Um, so one of them is how do you ensure consistency of all those taxonomies across repositories? And those different repositories can be different SharePoint sites, but they could, uh, as I mentioned, go beyond SharePoint and be um, your S3 um, buckets or um, um, your file directories or your um, uh, other content repository, including databases that, that you may have. And then um, how do you scale up the process of tagging? So you have this vocabulary that is available for annotating uh, content with, um, but then um, that process of annotation needs to happen. And sometimes we can rely on people to do that, um, but people are busy and this does not uh, scale all that well. Mm, everyone wants to find the right content when they need it. Now, um, tasks for managing the content and tagging as part of managing content, of course, um, people tend to be uh, less keen to do because they, they focused on uh, why they're using that content on, at, at this point, not how um, to ensure that it can be best found by someone else. Um, so, in uh, as we switch to the demo um, by Jesse, he will um, address both of those challenges and discuss how um, uh, how they can be um, addressed by in an enterprise in general and specifically by the products such as Top Right Edge. Over to you, Jesse. All right, thank you, Irene. I am sharing my screen here in a second. <clears throat> and I'll begin my demo today in SharePoint instead of Top Rate Edge. We will get to Top Rate Edge, but using SharePoint as the target, as Irene introduced, um, we need to start talking about that idea of a controlled vocabulary. And most content management systems will have some element of a, a tag set or a term store, as SharePoint calls it. Um, but you're going to have a very limited tooling available to you. And whenever it's done in these limited tooled ways, you usually don't have um, really good access to them either. 
there. So there's no like centralized term store capability here. It's really specifically just for SharePoint. So you're not going to easily leverage it anywhere else. So, um, but that being said, at least it does have it. So here we're looking at SharePoint and um, an admin or manager can come in and look at the content services where you'll find what they call term store. And underneath term store, you can get busy starting to build what they call tag sets <clears throat> or term sets and terms within those term sets. So for example, I've got webinar term group down here. If I expand this and we look at this category called topics, um, if I wanted to work with this, um, I, I can I can add things. So let's go ahead and click on semantic web standards here, which already has a few um, sub terms under it and I want to add something. So I can absolutely edit and work here, um, but I don't have any, um, if I have access, I can kind of do what I want is the way that this is established. So you're, you're usually going to be dealing with a not very often changed um, environment. Um, it's going to be usually very limited set of terms uh, because the tooling isn't really encouraging that work. It's not encouraging collaboration. There's definitely no governance controls to it, but at least I can do something like an add here. So if we wanted to add RDFS, as one of the semantic web standards now that is used to help me in navigation ways or in tagging ways categorization ways anywhere that this term store was to get called upon and put in action as part of the sharepoint sites and directories work um, so at least it is here and available to me um, but really if i wanted to have rich controlled vocabulary capabilities, especially if I wanted to leverage them enterprise-wide and not just inside of SharePoint. Something like Top Rate Edge comes to mind um, and would be really nice if we could pull this in, govern it inside of our Top Rate Edge environment, and then make that available through web services and connectors to leverage anywhere that you need that controlled vocabulary. And with it being centralized in a semantic standards and uh, knowledge graph like Top Rate Edge, with governance features, um, you're going to be able to do that collaboration, uh, rich descriptions, synonyms, all kinds of extra characteristics in a much more fluid, organic way than you are in a rigid structure like the term store management here in front of us with SharePoint. So what I wanna do is show you how Top Rate Edge can grab this term store um, or a component of it or just a piece of it and bring it in to Top Rate Edge now and what I'll do is I'll switch over to my top rate edge environment, click the new button and create a taxonomy. And we'll call this taxonomy something like data governance topics or something like that. So let's go with DG topics and all of the default characteristics are fine for me uh, for demo purposes. Let's go ahead and create this taxonomy and now I have a new empty container called a taxonomy inside of top rate edge that I could start manually populating and creating, or we could load RDF or spreadsheets, um, actually bootstrap it with a raw document and it'll, it'll extract all the keywords for you. Uh, so ways to kind of like jump ahead there instead of starting from scratch. But we know that we have that SharePoint work that we've already done over there in SharePoint. So, there's a new import option for import from SharePoint Term Store. And this kind of connector can be created for any kind of content management system. And it's also exposed as a web service. So this could all take part in an automation uh, pipeline as well. So this is a web service, but today I'm just using it as a human user. So I'll click on import from SharePoint Term Store. And we just have to navigate. Um, I could take an entire high level category or I could navigate down. And I'm just interested in that topics section that we were working on. And we'll pull that in. And Top Rate right Edge will now grab that, remembering the SharePoint unique IDs because good old Microsoft is always going to put their GUIDs on their things. And Top Rate right Edge is smart enough to say, hey, I'm going to remember those because I'm going to be able to synchronize them. And I'm also going to be able to cause new GUIDs to get created if we wanted to push content in that direction. So that's one of the key connector um, capabilities there with the SharePoint connection. So now that we've imported, we've got our nine terms 
here, this should look very familiar to you, and you see RDFS is here because we had just added that as part of the webinar today. And now what I want to do is just show that it is full loop. And if I had the time in a perfect world, if we were in, you know, in uh, an enterprise, uh, my screen wouldn't necessarily look the way it does because I can click on knowledge graph here and I get the edit button. And I can also right click on this and create new. So what I mean is in a perfect world, um, and if I had the time to fully demonstrate like uh, governance workflows, I should just be signed in as the viewer. What I'm gonna do right now is actually change the production copy just for demo purposes. But ideally I would only be a viewer and to propose my new concept for someone to review and approve and bring into the production copy, Top Rate Edge would let me use what we call workflows. Uh, any kind of controlled sequence, uh, validation, approval, thumbs up, voting, reach out to external services, uh, anything that you would really need to um, pipe things together the way that you need them to, we call a workflow. And that would be the ideal way to do this. But um, as I said, for demo purposes, I'm going to just directly edit the production copy because I'm signed in as an admin and we're gonna create top rate edge as a subterm to knowledge graph. Oh, I need to back up. SharePoint does expect you to tag with language, English, US, and now I can click okay. So the SharePoint site was uh, communicated over the connector that it did expect a specific language formatting. And that's what you saw me um, have to make an adjustment there. So top rate edge, in English US was the way that the um, SharePoint site was uh, established. So uh, Top Rate Edge is just enforcing that so that we keep consistent language tags here. But there's nothing stopping me now from adding multiple preferred labels in alternative languages. And I can also show all of the other SCOS default properties available to you in Top Rate Edge, like alternative labels and definitions. Definition will be something like a rich text field that you could edit. And due to the rich ontology modeling capabilities in Top Rate Edge, we could take this DG topics taxonomy <clears throat> to a whole new level and start representing more semantic relationships and more horizontal and even vertical relationships other than the defaults that are available here. But even with just with this default set of SCOS properties for taxonomy standards, um, a much richer and um, better experience than having to create key value pairs inside of the, the SharePoint term store. Um, so with that being said, we could collaborate, govern, control, comment, task each other, really work this thing up, load it from all kinds of different places if necessary, bring it together and say, all right, this is now our gold standard controlled vocabulary and it's available through web services. And we can also push or publish this out to other sources to react to. SharePoint today, for example, but even our own Top Rate Explorer can be published to whenever changes are made. Uh, and what I would do now is go to the Exports tab to push in the other direction to get this content back into SharePoint. Uh, but once again, this is a web service, so this can all be uh, automated. So a controlled workflow would be able to pull the content from SharePoint automatically, ask you to do what you need to do whenever it's your turn to do it. Um, whether that's a get things done kind of, you know, role or a review it and look over it kind of role, approve it um, and then commit and then on commit, publish and exporting to explore or to SharePoint could, ha could happen automatically. Here, I'm going to just engage um, export to SharePoint store and it's going to let us know, oh, there was one thing added. We made no edits, we didn't delete anything, we added one concept and we pushed that over. So now if we go back to our SharePoint site and refresh there, we have to navigate real quick because it didn't remember that I had that open. Topics, Knowledge Graph now has a child under it and there's Top Rate Edge which never existed before and was definitely not created here in SharePoint. We edited that and, and governed it, controlled it, put it through a workflow, all of that things that we should have done 
and then pushed it out and published and that's how it got back here into SharePoint. But this isn't, my, the point is, this isn't the only place that this controlled vocabulary could go if it was in top rate edge. It could be used by anyone for whatever reason it was that you needed them to be using it. Now, with that being said, we have part of the story. We've got the controlled vocabulary and we made it available to the enterprise, for example, here in SharePoint for it to be used for navigation, directory management, um, uh, tagging of sites. And that brings us to the next part, large drives or folder structures of documents, like Irene said, uh, large enterprises with thousands and thousands of employees with uh, terabytes or petabytes of data. And with most of that being, most of that data being unstructured, things like search, even though, as Irene said, we've been talking about it for over 20 years, search is still fairly weak in most situations. So we need to be able to enrich that content and allow people to go shopping for data, allow people to go discovering data through things like facets and filters. And that's where these kinds of controlled vocabularies get put into action, but we need that content in the first place. And that content, for example, being in a SharePoint site like this, I have two different directories here uh, for this webinar site. One I called training, which has like 80 documents in it. And then another uh, full list of research papers. There's hundreds of documents in this repository. So what we want to do is we want to pull these documents into top rate edge and enrich them. And when I say pull them in, I don't mean the binaries and redundant storage. I mean the metadata about them and a connector that is able to reach out and utilize these documents when we need it. And we also want to be able to free text index these things so that we can auto classify them and interconnect them with everything else that could be inside of your knowledge graph, not just taxonomies, but maybe other corpus collections or um, other uh, data assets and even structured data, column data, CSV data, um, so that everything can be interconnected and map to that same common language. That was one of Irene's key points on you know, the value gained of having controlled vocabularies. Everyone speaking the same language, which is really important. So what we need now is a connector in top rate edge that can reach out and get the metadata about these documents. So we'll go back to top rate edge now and click new. And instead of creating a taxonomy this time, we'll create a corpus. And with that corpus, we'll name this something like SharePoint Docs. And there's a connector choice here for SharePoint now. Also, once again, fairly straightforward to add these types of connectors to top rate edge. Um, and as we harden them over time, we do make them out of the box, but all of the tooling is available for us to create custom connectors to any kind of content management system. Uh, we run into a lot of different things out in the wild. Um, so often we, we would need to put in a, a special connector or adjust even these default connectors. Uh, but for today, the, the default SharePoint connector is going to work for me. And we'll click continue. And this will present me kind of like the taxonomies did where it was like, what did you want to pull in? And we could globally go across the upper level or we could say, well, there's only this portion of documents underneath the site for webinar, uh, SharePoint site that we want, and I'll just pull in the 80 documents. So I click this and we'll create our corpus. And now what Edge is doing is, is it's streaming in that metadata. So if I'm able to click over here on documents quick enough, we might actually um, get it in, in, in line. So there's 23 results right now. If I refresh my browser, it's going to be more than 23. Um, there we are, we're up to 38. So I'm um, streaming in those documents in the sense of their metadata and free text indexing them, making them highly searchable. And we're also capturing the semantic model of these things. Um, this document is a document, which is important because the semantic model or the ontology for what a document is says, well, you should have an access link. You should have a title. Uh, what was your file name? What's your content type? What is your content field? So that we could free text index it. And we could also take that model and add any kind of relationship or semantic relationship we would want. Um, maybe it mentions a country or maybe it 
talks about active ingredients, or maybe it mentions a person or an or organization. So instead of just having that generic tag cloud where everything is just connected via the topic relationship, we can take this model and make it as rich as you want it to be, um, and that would make your taggings and your categories just that much more relevant. Um, so that being said, we've got these documents now available to us in Top Rate Edge to tag. And we primarily want to tag in an automated way. So we're really here to talk about auto classification because I can't do the work to tag hundreds of thousands or millions of documents. Um, no matter how good your taxonomists or librarians are, you, they do need help. They need a workforce multiplier. And that's where our human in the loop approach to auto classification comes in and can be quite key. So with a set of documents like this now available to me, um, I can manually work with them and connect them, but just like all of the other types of collections in Edge. But this corpus collection has a unique sibling um, collection called tag sets. So I'm going to create another collection here, and it's content tag set. This is a nice sibling collection for corpus. It allows us to separate the taggings, which are most likely going to be automated, so that we can rerun them, test them, uh, drop them, change the taxonomy, run the tag set again, and we're never um, manipulating the, the source corpus metadata. We really just want to be able to have that separation of concerns architecture to say, these are tags, they're relationships between corpuses and taxonomies in this case, and I want to be able to purge them, rerun them, trigger them, version them, and govern them separately uh, for that lifecycle purpose. So we'll create this tag set now. And what I need to do is name it. We'll just go quick demo um, tag set. And I create a connection between our, um, where is our SharePoint docs? And let's go ahead and just t connect this up for demo purposes to that DG topics that we also pulled from SharePoint. And I'll create this. And this is the user interface now for tagging. And I don't have any extra relationships, any of those semantic relationships that I said. So we will just go with the default topic going against my recommendation. And we'll create this. And now I'm presented with what we call tagger and I can tag these documents manually. Now, manually does have a, a bad, um, you know, a bad taste, but at least I don't have to write any code. And I really only need to tag a dozen or so documents. So it's a no code training process for the auto classifier because the machine learning model does want to rely on your input. So tagging 10 to 20, 12 to 24 documents is a good way to get started. And the user interface allows you to click on the documents, get to the raw document itself in case you need to reference the whole thing, um, and then use this interface to simply um, tag. And what, what it'll do is it's going to pop up an interface to allow us to select or search for our content. So if I wanted to search for top braid, I could start typing it in. And if this was a large taxonomy, that, that search capability, you know, that's what we're talking about. Search is important. So I searched, I found what I was interested in. I can click on this and I can add this tag now. And Edge is now tracking the fact that that document is tagged with top braid Edge. You do this for several documents, like I said, a dozen or so and you've got a good starting point to trigger auto classification. For demo purposes, I've got a much larger set of documents with a much larger macroeconomics taxonomy that was already put through uh, the training of, of um, a, a dozen or so documents, and we can trigger auto classification. So I'm gonna just switch over to that environment because we don't wanna really just be seeing those that I'm deciding to tag, what we really want to see is the recommended concepts that are going to be coming from auto classification then. So I'll switch over to my macroeconomics documents. And once this larger set of documents is available to me, what we're really after is looking at them 
from a recommended concepts point of view. They're recommended because they've not been accepted. These recommendations came from auto classifier, landed in a workflow or like in a sandbox isolation, and they're percolating up to the screen now saying, hey, do you want to accept me? Do you want to approve these? You know, this document, 78% probability that it is about consumption, 75% probability that it is about job quality. And if I move down to the next document, this one's talking about financial crisis and debt crisis. And these high probabilities, everything 50 and above, you really do want to start taking into consideration and approving these. And over time, what you're doing by approving them is you're making your training set that much better, that much smarter. So as you accept terms, instead of make them up in the first place, you're just accepting and going into a review process. So that's the workforce multiplier that tag creators and data management users, uh, librarians, taxonomists will be able to benefit from and go into a review process instead of a create it from scratch process and approve these high level probabilities, turn that back into the training set, which is very, very simple to do at top rate edge. And you get a much smarter, higher probability set of tags coming back over time. And that human in the loop process is all governed through workflows. And if I go to the auto classifiers tab, you'll see I actually have several different runs of this that I've already done. It only takes a few minutes for it to run on hundreds of documents. Um, and it can scale out very, very well across many, many documents. And you run them through and review them and approve them. At some point in time, you will be just satisfied with the tagging that's happening and you can turn it in on automatic. So this whole sequence, once nicely trained and reviewed and approved, can just run in full automated mode. So the pulling of content, the pulling of taxonomies, the governing of those, the, the governing of those is human in the loop always. But then once you put them into action through auto classification like this, um, the, the semantic connections are put into place automatically and then it can be indexed. And then even right here within top rate edge itself, if I do a keyword search here at the top, which is always available to me, I can do a keyword search on banking. And it's great. That was free text search. I even just in my small demo environment, I've got 62 results that match banking. The great thing is about top rate edge is that banking could have matched anything. These could be taxonomy concepts, glossary terms, data structures, data elements. In this case, most of these are research papers coming from the corpus, of course, um, but it could be searching everything in the knowledge graph and um, it could be a much larger number than 62, which means the facets and filters on the left-hand side, like the automated macroeconomics tag um, is, a, is a, a great benefit. So now we can drill in and say, I'm only interested in those that are tagged with financial crisis. And now I'm down to 12. And now I have filters available to me that are just related to these results. So we could drill down by author or source, year, um, document type, anything like that. So any of those semantic relationships that you can get in to the knowledge graph are going to be available to you here inside of Top Rate Edge. But more importantly, they're available to you anywhere. You can extract this Excel, CSV, um, through the GraphQL endpoint to work directly with JSON result sets. Always can extract RDF from Top Rate Edge, Semantic Web Standard there, uh, you know, serialization and RDF. So you can use and leverage this anywhere you want in SharePoint to enrich that search um, or any other system that you would have in your enterprise that could benefit from the interweaving and interconnecting that Top Rate Edge is doing here now. And with that, we're back to you, Irene. Thanks, Jesse, for uh, an excellent demo. And I have just a few concluding um, slides to to make some points so as uh, jesse demonstrated uh tab right edge can help you centralize management of controlled vocabularies 
that can then be used in different environments such as uh, SharePoint. And Tabrite Edge brings to this task um, many features supporting collaboration between taxonomies, uh, import, export of different sources, um, sourcing taxonomies from documents, uh, ensuring consistency of taxonomies with variety of checks and 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 on on and on. And um, then the auto classifications uh, feature uh, scales the process of content uh, tagging, allowing um, us to tag much more content faster and at a larger scale. And that means providing value to both applications and users that um, search for that content. Now, um, the content can be tagged in its entirety kind of in a batch process or it, only a subset of the content can be tagged including one document at a time so think about it as a real-time recommendation as a person adding a document to sharepoint um, going through tabrite edge through apis um, edge could generate rec recommend the tags and then all the person has to do is just accept them so that kind of uh, real-time interaction is also possible um, this process uses machine learning so it's all based on uh, taking a small set of documents using them for training there is no need to manually create rules for example and uh, human experts in this processes could always have a last word. Um, the machine learning type of algorithms are always um, uh, have this kind of a black box type of nature to them. And um, that can create some concerns. So having human in the loop, ability to review, ability to fine tune training sets, etc., addresses uh, they, that type of an issue. Some additional capabilities to mention and Jesse brought up uh, during his demo the fact that um, there's many integration points and APIs so everything can be triggered automatically and can be just automatic interfaces between different um, tools and, and top right edge. Uh, in terms of supported document formats, uh, literally hundreds of formats are supported. Uh, for content. Of course, all the Office documents, PDFs, um, you know, XML and uh, HTML and, and on and on. Now, um, the aspect of national languages and multilingual systems um, often come, um, uh, come into play and is important for many organizations. So from the perspective of taxonomy management in Tabred Edge, uh, you could use language tags as uh, Jesse has shown. So you could associ associate languages with different uh, labels, terms, synonyms. Um, all the languages are supported. In terms of dealing with content and automatically classifying content, um, the process uses algorithms, machine learning algorithms that are actually language neutral. Out of the box, um, Tabred Edge supports English, German, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, and it's quite easy to add support for additional language. All that's needed is a set of so-called stop words, things like the and and, that should be ignored for a particular language, and then a stemmer for a particular language, which are also stemming libraries are um, readily available. Now, this machine learning approach can be also uh, supplemented with custom rules that could run as part of the processing. And um, all of this can be instrumented in, in a workflow. So the workflow can deal not just with um, human in the loop kind of approval, but any kind of a processing. So you start auto classification, trigger it as a workflow, auto classification runs, then the next step can be, for example, running of some, uh, some rules. 
and or approval and or calling to some external system and or exporting generated tax and or doing anything else that um, that needs to be done and uh, here is an example of past processing rules for example um, they quite commonly can be used to create uh, different specific facets depending on the type of the term that is used to tag so let's say if it's a geographical term like a name of a city then um, the link between the content in that term instead of being just a generic topic link can be changed into location link one example um, and that's kind of shown in this picture where we have different facets like report type is one uh, facet process term uh, a year etc are uh, other facets another example of using uh, a rule and tabright edge supports creating very rich uh, rules is uh, maybe determining um, archiving or retention period so based on the available metadata about the document and also based on generated tags so that uh, body of enriched information uh, there can be a rule that would run that would determine well this document should be kept for five years uh, another example of uh, common use of uh, such such a rule and i want to uh, end on this architecture of process uh, conceptual architecture type of a picture of um, how Tabred Edge um, plays within um, a semantic search and semantic enrichment process. This was originally created um, with one of our customers, Mayo Clinic, a very long-term customer that uses Tabred Edge for uh, annotating its content and for driving all its search experience on its internal and external uh, websites. But it's um, it stood the test of time, actually, the overall concept, and it's well applies in um, all other environment. So on the left-hand side, you see the content that can come from various repositories um, and then subject matter experts that may be creating tagging vocabularies, maybe um, providing some uh, advice and judgment on, on tagging, and that those vocabularies are then can be used with different sets of uh, corpora and used by the uh, edge tagger and autoclassifier uh, module, creating tags, uh, generating this enriched search index that Jesse demonstrated at the end when he was doing search with facets and, and so on, applying uh, rules on top of it as necessary, and then um, driving user experience and search applications through either direct inter interaction with the Bright Edge or through some kind of APIs or even through exporting uh, those this generated uh, tags from the knowledge graph into whatever search environment that your organization may have. And uh, with that, I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you, Irene. I think we have time to take a couple of these questions. Um, and for everyone, if you haven't already, please go ahead and submit your questions or discussion points in the question box again located on the right hand side control panel and we'll go ahead and take a couple of these before the uh, end of the hour so jesse here's one for you you said we can take the content and taggings out of edge to use elsewhere how would we do that yeah that was probably an early on question because i mentioned the apis and then irene went over it again but um okay. yeah the apis would be the key for that um but there's also exports built into the user experience so you can export content as csvs or excel spreadsheets but there's also extracts to rdf and the web services the apis that's those would be key for a real enterprise integration so 
the GraphQL endpoint, the Sparkle endpoint, or the web services to extract larger um, bulk extracts of all of the content. Um, it's your knowledge, leverage it and use it wherever you need to. So Top Rate Edge isn't putting it in some sort of like proprietary format that you can't leverage and utilize. It's it's all yours. So um, take it and use it wherever you want and all the endpoints that you need are there for you to do so. Great, thank you, Jesse. Um, here's another one, maybe Jesse, you can start and Irene can add to it if she has anything. But what did you mean by no code training? Oh, with the with the tagging, a lot of times um, things like auto classification and entity extraction and all the NLP related things, um, you, you will often have to deal with like domain specific languages or just writing raw code. Um, uh, to affect and change or manipulate the algorithms under the hood. And the way that we've got Top Rate Edge implemented is a no-code approach. You tag enough documents to start the training and then incrementally build up your training through automation from there. So we're not expecting business users to come in and learn some sort of programming capability or needing a programming team with them just to get auto classification started. We've got Edge designed for business users so that they can get started on day one. Great, thank you, Jesse. I think we can go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. There are a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to, but um, we'll provide answers to those in the question to those questions in the form of an email response to all attendees. So thank you to Irene and, and Jesse for a great web webinar. Um, again, we'll be providing a link to the recorded presentation as well as to the slides. Um, thanks everyone for your attention and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay.